Good morning. Welcome to this Easter Sunday service at the United Presbyterian Church of Cortland. I'm Dave Johnson, the pastor, and we proclaim together today that Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. We're delighted to have you with us through this pre-recorded service. There are a couple of things we want to share with you uh, prior to the beginning of our service. First, that this is the time in our church's life when we collect funds for the one great hour of sharing of the Presbyterian Church USA, and we appreciate and covet any gifts you may give to the special ministry of our denomination. We also are continuing with our book study uh, via Zoom conferencing on Mondays at 11. The office hours in the church office are very flexible. Um, we have limited our staff to only a few hours a week. So if you need to contact the church office, please call the, the number and leave a message on the machine. Also, we would remind you that we have a church Facebook page and uh, you can keep up with each other and with, active, with events in church, the church's life, even in this restricted time through Facebook. And again, we will worship uh, remotely next Sunday and uh, for every Sunday that afterwards that we have to and we invite you to be part of those services uh, through pre-recorded internet broadcast. Our service begins with the organ prelude, Thine is the Glory. One of the special traditions in the life of the Christian church at Easter is called the dressing of the church, where symbols of our faith are brought in and displayed in front of the congregation. We have those symbols here today with us on the communion table. 
we have the cross, we have the candle of Christ's light, we have the chalice, the bread, water of baptism, and the Bible as God's word. I invite you to join with me if you have your bulletin online in the litany for the dressing of the church. You can read the dark printed part. Here is the cross, a sign of God's love. Jesus is our Savior and Lord, who lived, died, and rose again for us. Here is the candle, the light of Christ. Jesus is the light of the world, showing us God's holy way. Here is the Bible, the book of faith. Jesus is the word of God made flesh, who came to live among us. Here is the water, a sign of God's grace. Jesus gives us living water so that we may never be thirsty. Here is the bread, the body of Christ. Jesus is the bread of heaven, the food of everlasting life. Here is the cup, the sign of God's promise. Jesus is the vine and we are the branches growing together in faith, hope, and love. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And who everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Let us say, Christ is risen. We have seen the glory of God. Let us pray. Living God, on the first day of the week, you brought to birth a new creation through the powerful resurrection of Jesus Christ. Fill us with the hope and joy of new beginnings so that we may share the good news of your liberating, life-giving power with all the world. Through Christ our Savior, who is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit now and always. Amen. Our special music is a recording of the IHS choir. Now let all the heavens adore thee.
As we approach the reading of God's Word, let us pray. Living God, with joy we celebrate the presence of your risen Word, enliven our hearts by your Holy Spirit, so that we may proclaim the good news of eternal and abundant life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So, if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Thank you, Sue. Sharing a message with our children this morning is Carol Foster. Good morning, children of all ages. Flowers look beautiful. I brought a couple dozen, well, a dozen and a half of eggs. I thought maybe we could do some Easter egg dyeing. It's always a fun activity. Whoa. Look what's in the box. A beautiful egg. I don't think I've ever seen an egg decorated that beautifully. Reminds me of a story, a story of love and kindness and miracles. And isn't that what Easter is? There was an old woman named Babushka. And one snowy morning, she went out into the yard around her little house. And there was a herd of deer that could have come down out of the woods to get something to eat because the snow was covering up all the food for them in the woods. And she said, what a miracle to see them this morning. And then she heard a flock of geese high overhead honking away, but she noticed one goose was fluttering and dipping and then it plunged to the ground right in front of her. Its wing had a bloody hole in it. And Babushka said, that is the work of a hunter. She gently lifted that little goose and took it into her house where she cleaned the wound and bandaged it. And she fixed a bed for the goose in a basket with her best bed quilt. And day after day, that goose's wing healed and Babushka talked to the goose and the goose looked like I understood every word she said. She named it Rachenka, because everything that you talk to should have a name. Now, Babushka spent the winter painting Easter eggs. Her eggs were beautiful. And every year at the Easter festival in the village, she won the prize for the most beautiful eggs. She had quite a collection of them by now. Easter wasn't that far away. And every morning, that goose laid her an egg. So Babushka would take a pin and poke a little hole in the top and a little hole in the bottom and blow out the egg's yolk and white batter. And she'd fix that for her breakfast. And later she'd paint that egg very beautifully. Now the goose's wing was healing and it was moving around her little house. And one day it flapped up onto the table where she kept her painting materials. And it started knocking over her little pots of paint. And Babusha got all upset and she started to swat away at the goose who panicked. And it knocked her basket of decorated eggs to the floor. They were in pieces. Oh, Babushka thought, no Easter festival, I have nothing to take. But the next morning, 
In the goose's basket was the most beautiful egg she had ever seen. It looked like it had been painted right in the shell. And every morning in the basket, there was this gorgeous egg, each one different. So by the time the festival came, Babushka had a basket of eggs to take. It was Easter weekend, sun was shining, and Babushka said to Rashenka the goose, she said, now when I go, you are free. It is time you return to your flock. I have loved having you here. It has made my winter so much happier. So Babushka left, trudged her way into the village, and yes, she won the prize for the most beautiful eggs. Her prize was the most gorgeous bed quilt the end of the festival, folks had greeted each other after their long winter separation and enjoyed all the food, and she gathered up that new quilt, put it in her basket, and went back home. And as she walked home, a flock of geese flew overhead, and she looked up and she thought, I wonder if Roshenk is one of them. She got home and walked in, and then she could tell Roshenk was gone, the emptiness and the quiet. She had her cup of tea and some bread and went to bed with her new quilt pulled up to her chin. She hadn't paid any attention to Roshenka's bed. But in the middle of the night, she started hearing these sounds, little, little tiny scratchings. She got up and lit her candle and she looked in the basket and there was an egg and a little pecking from inside. Pretty soon, a little beak burst through the shell. And there was the most beautiful little yellow goose. Roshenka had left a gift for Babushka. That little goose stayed with Babushka for the rest of their days. I love that story. Babushka was one who truly noticed miracles and understood the power of love and kindness. And to me, that's what Easter is all about. The power of God's love and kindness, his gift to us of Jesus, and the miracle that even after Jesus was put on the cross, he still lives in you, in me, in all of us. Let's have a prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you. We thank you for those things, for kindness. And we've all experienced it. Probably we should give it to others more often, but we try. Thank you for love, invisible, yet better than Gorilla Glue. Thank you for miracles. We still have them. Be with these children who might be out there, and the adults too. We pray for wellness in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. Happy Easter. Carolyn Winfrey Gillette is one of the, is a contemporary hymn writer who writes new words to old hymn tunes. She has written a special Easter celebration for this particular Easter to the tune of The Church is One Foundation. Listen to the words.
This Easter celebration is not like the ones we've known. We pray in isolation. We sing the hymns alone. We're distant from our neighbors, from worship leaders too. No flowers grace the chancel to set a festive mood. No gathered choirs are singing, no banners lead the way. O oh God of love and promise, where's the joy this Easter day? With sanctuaries empty, may homes become the place. We ponder resurrection and celebrate your grace. Our joy won't come from worship that's in a crowded room, but from the news of women who saw the empty tomb. Our joy comes from disciples who ran with haste to see, who heard that Christ is risen and then by grace believed. In all the grief and suffering, may we remember well, Christ suffered crucifixion and faced the powers of hell. Each Easter bears the promise Christ rose that glorious day. Now nothing in creation can keep your love away. We thank you that on Easter your church is blessed to be a scattered faithful body that's doing ministry. In homes and in places of help and healing too, we live the Easter message by gladly serving you. We do have some joys and concerns to share. Tom Beatty is home from rehab and re continuing his recovery at home. Helen Hart continues to mend at her son's house. Nancy Hatch continues to get better from her surgeries at home. And we ask you to keep Niles Brown and Donna Johnson Brown in your prayers as Niles is a patient at Strong Memorial Hospital in uh, Rochester and covets your prayers and thoughts. We had a joy this last Thursday as members and friends gathered safely uh, to, in their cars in a parking lot to say goodbye to Russ and Linda Ruthick as they completed their move to their new winter home, uh, summer home in Maine. So that was a, a very special farewell uh, by the congregation to Russ and Linda. If you have joys and concerns you'd like to share with us, please do so by sending me a text or an email or calling my cell or the church office. Now let us be in prayer. Gracious and eternal God, you've given us the gift of life. You've created a world in which we live, a universe in, that is so powerful and endless like you. We thank you for the gift of your word. We thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ, whose resurrection we celebrate. And we thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit that moves among us and sustains us and guides us and encourages us and is present even in difficult times like this. We pray for those who need your care, for those who are sick, hospitalized, for those who are recovering and healing, for those who struggle being isolated, for those who have difficult decisions to make. We pray for those who serve us going, endangering their own lives by, as policemen or firemen and 
healthcare workers and doctors and nurses. We pray for those who see that we have food on the shelves at the grocery store and those who transport and provide essential services. We pray also for those who are victims of violence, those who have experienced violence in the home or on a street, those who are refugees from war. We pray for those who need a special message from your heart to give them peace and to arrest their anxiety. All this we pray in the name of Jesus Christ who taught us to pray together by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our special music is a recording of the IHS choir, Joy in the Morning.
This Easter's second scripture lesson is from John 20, verses 1 through 18. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went towards the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned round and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? For whom are you looking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Join me in prayer. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. On that first Easter day, the Gospel of John tells us that Mary Magdalene went to the tomb to see Jesus. It was early in the morning, and it was probably hard to see anything at a distance her footsteps were firm and quick, even though her heart was heavy. She had been so close to Jesus. In many ways, she was almost like a 13th disciple, but that wasn't possible in a male-dominated society. Why was she going to the tomb? According to John's account, Jesus' body had already been prepared for burial with spices, and wrapped in linen cloths. She probably felt the need to be close to him once again. It's hard to say goodbye, to know that you'll never hear the sound of his voice or watch him mingle with the crowds that often followed him. At the time of the death of a loved one, we as human beings often need closure, a way to say goodbye. It's been this way for people ever since the beginning of time. And closure sometimes comes with a funeral rite or some family traditions or some, bur some burial practices. The haste at which Jesus had been placed on, in the tomb on Friday night did not permit such closure acts. And Mary probably felt like it was important to be with him and to be close to him, 
like a lot of us feel the need to be close when we've lost a loved one. The restrictions that we all experience now around the coronavirus pandemic limit what families can do to visit loved ones in the hospital or to be together at the time of death. And my heart goes out to them. They have to put their grief on hold until a later time when it's safe for us all. When I see death notices in the Cortland Standard, my eyes seem to gap pause over the words, services will be scheduled later. And so my thoughts and prayers are with family members and friends of the one who, ones who have died, as well as those who are hospitalized and isolated uh, from family and friends. As Mary came to the garden that first Easter morning, she must have thought about the guards that had been posted the Friday night to guard the tomb. Would those guards let her into the tomb? Would they offer to roll away the stone for her? Or would they even let her sit nearby to think about Jesus and shed a tear? When she could finally see the tomb in the early morning light, there were no guards. The stone had been rolled off to the side, and not looking any further, she turns on her heel and runs to the disciples for help. Peter and the beloved disciple go back with Mary to the tomb. The disciple peers in and sees it empty. Peter goes in. Mary stays outside weeping. The disciples leave and Mary finally gets the courage to look into the tomb. She sees the linen wrappings, but she also sees two heavenly figures, two angels. And they ask her, woman, why are you weeping? She tells them and suddenly behind her is a figure of a man that she thinks is the gardener. It's Jesus and when he speaks to her and calls her name, she recognizes him. They talk, and Mary's able to go to the disciples with the words, I have seen the Lord. And so Mary Magdalene was the first one to see the risen Christ. Others would encounter the Christ and be visited by him, but she was first. I wonder if she was believed when she went to those disciples or just dismissed as another histor hysterical woman, woman wrapped up in grief. John doesn't tell us. I can appreciate Mary's need to go to the tomb and see Jesus once again. Jesus had changed her life. He had taught her so much. He had opened her eyes to God and to God's kingdom. And she did not want him to fade into memory. She needed to see him for herself. She couldn't imagine that he was gone. Her need was met, but not in the way that she expected. The story of Mary Magdalene at the tomb reminds me that there are still many who are seeking to see Jesus. Some of us in pain seek Jesus, the healer. Others who are facing huge life challenges seek Jesus, the teacher. Some seek a great, greater understanding of life from Jesus and seek Jesus, the miracle worker. Or they seek Jesus as the one who will bring in God's new kingdom and do away with the evil, pain, and suffering so often found in our world or others seek a very personal Jesus who will be the bearers of God's forgiveness and grace. And yes, others seek a Jesus who will make all things right. Like Mary, many of us seek Jesus where we think he will be found. Often it's a journey, a journey that leads us to unexpected places. We think we know that we're, we think we know what Jesus will look like when we find him. So many of us have different images of Jesus. Those images may be drawn from the Gospels and from the rest of the writings of Christian scriptures. 
those images may have been planted in our minds as children or by a story we were told or a picture we were given or a a film we watched. Jesus may look different to every different to every person. And yet it's the same Jesus who comes to us as Jesus came to Mary in the garden. He probably won't come in a blaze of light with a thunderclap and trumpets. He may come quietly while we're in a special place, perhaps a place like this. We may not recognize him at first, but he will come. He may come as a friend, a guide, a comforter. For others can be Jesus for us, helping us to see that Jesus is always part of our lives in faith and ready to reach out and embrace us when we open our lives to him. He may call our name and we will know. That's what the story of Mary Magdalene in the garden means to me. There is so much we can see in Jesus. The Bible tells us things and we can learn if we open our hearts and minds. And we can feel him most near and close when we gather with others in the faith community. Right now we are coming together by online worship. We must do what we must do to be loving, caring, and safe. But it's not as powerful and as transforming as physically being together, whether it is in this sanctuary or in one of our classrooms or in the choir room or the fellowship hall or the kitchen or the chapel or even in the parking lot while we're having one of those good parking lot conversations. In their grief, confusion, and denial, the disciples of Jesus sought each other out that very evening that Mary encountered Jesus in the garden. They recognized they needed each other. They needed to talk. They needed to try to understand what had just happened. It was in that fellowship, in that community, in that sharing that they saw Jesus. Remember Thomas, one of the 11, was not with them. He would not believe in the resurrection, he later told them, until he could see and touch Jesus for himself. That would happen a week, again, a week later, when again in the midst of their community, Jesus came and approached Thomas. Thomas saw and Thomas believed. On this Easter, my prayer is that we will soon be able to draw God's power and grace by coming together and being part of a community of faith that can be in each other's presence. May this be a way for all of us to see Jesus and the life he offers. The new life that he offers is best described by John, the writer of Revelation when he shared this vision. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, see, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them they will be his people, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. May you see and know Jesus on this Easter day. Amen. It has been a tradition at United Presbyterian that at the conclusion of the Easter service, the choir joined by volunteers from the congregation sing together the Hallelujah Chorus. We have a recording of that from a previous year, the choir, the congregation, and the organ.
Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you this Easter day. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.